they're kind of creepy. Um, <laughs> but um, but uh, you know, if you see those, you know, you'll say, well, the marionette, you know, they just pull the strings and you know, he, his limbs twirl around and all of this, but he's not alive. This is the whole Pinocchio problem. Um, but um, but somebody who is who is a priest, he is alive. So God is actually using the humanity of the priest in order to accomplish his goal. Here's what Saint Jose Maria Escriva says about the New Testament priest. He says that it is Jesus in the Holy Mass who lends. Oh no, no, I should say. Uh, the priest lends the Lord his voice, his hands, his whole being. Isn't that wonderful? We can only use inanimate objects as our instruments, or you can try to use uh, animate objects like a dog, you know, to go do my will, you know, fetch, kill, and so on. Um, but then when you try to have a human being be your instrument, it's impossible that you can get that human being to do everything you want, right? I mean, married women, yes, that's right. Um, it's impossible. Um, you, can, you, you can only try to cooperate with them. You can try to move them from the outside by, um, you know, by, by giving them um, threats or <laughs> however it is, you know, you move people, um, rewards. But Christ, what he does is he uses a human being as his living instrument now, and, and, the, and the goal, then, is to so transform the priest that the priest, we say, is not his own. That the thoughts of the priest, the actions of the priest, the words of the priest, they should be all the thoughts of Christ, the words of Christ, the actions of Christ. So, so he's supposed to be conformed interiorly to Christ so that exteriorly his actions match Christ. Okay, so let's talk about first when, um, when did Christ found the priesthood? At what last point? Hmm? Last supper. At the Last Supper. And what point at the Last Supper? At the Eucharist. Yeah. And what did he say? Do this in memory. Do this in Wow, you're okay. Yeah, I you, you're already Catholic. <laughs> <laughs> Good job. All right. Yeah. Okay, so did everybody hear Mike? Um, because he was right on the money. We're gonna stop there while you're ahead, you know. So um, so so yes, Christ. Now, <laughs> now remember when, uh, whenever God commands you to do something, he gives you the power to do it. So when he says, do this in memory of me, he's actually giving those first apostles who are with him the ability to accomplish that. Do this in memory of me. Do what? Transform this bread and this wine into my body and blood. Because he had just said, this is my body. This is my blood. So now he commands them, do this in memory of me. He's not just suggesting this like, well, look, I, I had, a, I, had um, I cooked, and look, I cooked pita bread, and I brought my favorite wine. Do this in memory of me. Have, you know, have a fun little meal. If you have the Catholic understanding of the Eucharist, recognizing that, no, this is really Jesus disguised as bread, disguised as wine. This is not something that a person can do on your own. It's something that you could only do through the power of God. Do this in memory of me. So that's why we say that, that was his ordination. And then later on, it says when he breathed on the Holy Spirit, uh, the breathed the Holy Spirit upon the apostles, gave them power to confess sins. That would be the second moment of ordination <coughs> at that point. And so we say, well, what are the primary, the two primary acts, sacramental acts of a priest? To hear confessions, forgive them and then to celebrate Holy Mass. Okay, so what this shows us then is that the priest, on the one hand, isn't acting from his own self. The priest is not um, sort of like this motivated guy. You know, I think that I want to be a priest today. And the, and the, and the guy sits down and kind of like, Dear Jesus, I love you. Make me a priest. <laughs> um, it doesn't work that way. <laughs> What's that? We said it was Protestant circles. <laughs> um, <laughs> we also notice that a priest is not a delegate simply of the people. Even in the Old Testament, the Levite didn't act on behalf of the, the tribe of Levi. They weren't delegates of, of the tribe of Judah. The Levites were their own special class, given by God. The priesthood, even in the Old Testament, was a gift from God. And so the priesthood of the New Testament 
even more so is a gift from God. Because it, they're not acting as like, you know, people get together and, and then they vote. It's not as if the whole tribe of Judah got together and said, okay, who in, who in the tribe of Judah wants to be a priest? Well, I think I do. Okay, we're going to send you off to synagogue school, and then, you know, if you're good, then we'll ordain you a priest. No, even the Jews didn't do that. You were the tribe of Levi. God gave you the tribe of Levi. Okay, now go be a priest. And so similarly, in the New Testament, we say it's not simply that the people kind of vote on who they want the priest to be. He's not simply acting as the delegate of the people. And then like, well, I'll be priest for three years and I'll kind of come back. <laughs> you know, you can kind of like switch roles. No, this is something that comes from Christ. He's chosen by Christ. Now sometimes Christ chooses uh, unworthy ministers, which is part of Christ's mystery. So um, how many of the disciples betrayed Jesus in the, uh, in the Garden of Gethsemane? How many? Twelve. Well, no. No, there weren't 13. <laughs> there were only 12. Yeah, I'm sure there's a 13th person who wanted to. Um, but, um, so, so we say, well, Judas, Judas betrayed Christ. He's the one who betrayed Christ with a kiss. He betrayed the Son of Man with a kiss. Can you believe that? Actually, kisses betray a lot. But, um, that's just, that's it. The, um, isn't there a song? Anyway, um, so the uh, so 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 Judas betrays him, but um, they all leave Christ for a moment. John, the beloved, he follows Christ pretty quickly, but even he's you know he's not there for Christ at that very moment. Okay, so we say, why did Christ choose men who are going to betray him? Well, because Christ chose human beings, not angels. And Christ has the ability to uh, to forgive and to help men to repent. So, okay. So the um, so the apostles then they are human beings chosen by Christ for a particular purpose. What's the purpose? Well, it's the same roles that Christ had. They are there one for the liturgical role to bless God, uh, to bless the people. They are there to teach, so the priests ought to have knowledge, and then they are also there not so much as judges in the way that Christ is a judge, and not, not the way that a Levite was a judge, but there's something special about um, even priests in the Holy Catholic Church that they can help to judge moral cases. It's always been the case that when people have difficulty, um, they, they will come and try to receive help. You know, Father, help me to understand this. And it's not simply because we have theological knowledge, but that somehow... Uh, if the people have always believed that Christ wants to work through this instrument to help people to come to a deeper knowledge of him by means of discriminating between good and bad. Okay. So, um, so how does priesthood look now? How does the ordination, what's the right? So there are going to be visible elements to it. Remember we said that the Old Testament priest was anointed with oil? The New Testament priest, the priesthood of the church, um, He's anointed with oil. So when I was anointed <coughs> with oil, they actually take the, uh, the, the the holy oil and they anoint the palms of your hands. Okay? So they anoint the palms of your hands. And that's to indicate now your hands will be blessing and your hands will be uh, holding the Eucharist. In the Eastern uh, churches, in communion with Rome, so the Byzantine Catholic churches and so on, um, after Mass, actually, so after the final blessing, then Father will go to the back, and everybody will get in a line, and they'll ask for another blessing, and then they'll kiss his hands. And um, I keep asking Father Andre and Joseph if we could do that here. And, you know, he thinks it's great, but Father Joseph is kind of, you know, he's the, he's the sticky wheel. So, um, so, so one, there's the anointing of the hands. Next, there's the laying on of hands. Okay, so the laying on of hands is this gesture. We, you, see this, you see us do this in the Eucharist, right? So we call down the Holy Spirit. So now the bishop, he calls down the Holy Spirit upon this man, and he asks God to ordain him. And so there's that gesture as well. And then there's also what we call the handing over of the instruments. And so here, um, there's a point in the ordination, right, where the priest receives the chalice and the paten with a piece of bread and then the bishop gives it to, to him. And that's to be, that's in a way, that's kind of like when the married couple have their rings. You see, the rings are a sign of your fidelity. 
And the chalice, then, is a sign of my fidelity to the church. This is a, a symbol of what I am to do and what I am to be. I am to make present the Eucharist, and I am supposed to be an image of Christ. And then there's the wearing of special vestments. And so priests have their garb, which is... We're not going to get into all these details, uh, unless you have questions later on. Okay. Now, um, so we've talked about the roles of the priest. we talked about the point of ordination. And I think it's useful just to talk about the effects of ordination just for a second. So the first effect is that it does something to the soul of the man who is ordained a priest. Now, how many times can you be baptized? Just once. That's once. Yeah. If, you know, if it's a valid baptism, just one time. That's all it takes. You know, you're in your car, you have your friend. Okay, you actually, your friend recovers. The jaws of life pull the door off the car. They pull out your bloody friend and helicopter him out. And you're like, who am I? And, um, and now he's saved. Is he going to get baptized again? No. It worked. Okay? So there's certain sacraments that we don't repeat. And the sacraments that we don't repeat, we say, they leave... An indelible mark on the soul. An indelible mark is, we might say, is a spiritual scar. <laughs> when um, when the uh, when the Romans when the Romans would um, bring people into the Roman army, what they would do is they would actually take a brand, just the way you would brand, you know. A, a cow or something like that, and put it into your skin. Shh. From now on, you are a Roman citizen, and you're part of the Roman army. And they were proud to have that, because this means that anywhere in the Roman Empire, whether I'm in Gaul, you know, if they're in France, or if I'm in Northern Africa, or if I'm out there in Turkey, everywhere I go, I am a part of this legion, this institution, I'm protected by their laws, I'm fed by their food, and I'm paid by their money. So now I have this you know, special identity. So, so the analogy then for Catholics is once you are baptized, you receive that mark on your soul. When God looks out on all the souls, he sees some and he says, those are my children. They're mine. I like to tell people that when... Um, you know, when you have your children naturally, you know, they're always connected to you by genetics. You know, like, they're always your children. That's the name of a soap opera. And, um, how do I know that? <laughs> well, you know, I research. And, um, so, uh, so, so God looks out there, and he sees those souls. And so, similarly, in the way that you look out, and your child is always yours, no matter what happens, they're always going to be tied to you. No matter how far they wander, no matter you know what they do to reject you, I hate you. You're not my mom. You're not my dad. Um, you know it's you know they're coming back for dinner, and um, this 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 is how God is. He looks at the souls who have been baptized, and they have a special connection to Him. The way that the author Evelyn Waugh described it, he said that uh, every soul connected to God has a string going from your heart to the heart of God. And whenever he likes, he can pluck that little string and turn you around. So that's, that's the indelible mark of baptism. The indelible mark of priesthood, we say, connects you to, uh, to God in a special way. And um, the way that it connects you to God is particularly through Christ the priest. So, um, so every... Uh, so what baptism does is it gives you now the power to act as a child of God. You can now offer yourself up to God and, and feel that you can offer yourself up knowing that he will accept you. For the priest, not only does he offer himself up as in baptism, he actually offers up Christ back to God. And he offers up the whole people of God back to God. You see? When uh, Abel performed this, the sacrifice, offering something to God, he gave God a little lamb. When the Levites offered up sacrifices, they did sheep and goats, a little dove. When Christ offered things, he offered himself, the most valuable thing, because he's God. So he gave himself to God. He says, I'm fully yours. And God the Father fully accepted him. 
Remember when Jesus died? He said, into your hands I commend my spirit. And so now the priest has this union with that sacrifice of Christ and that self-offering of Christ. The priest says, I offer me, and I offer you, and I give the whole world back to you. And that explains that last triangle. You see, it's, it's that offering up spiritual sacrifice. So there's an indelible mark on the soul, and what this means is that once a man is ordained a priest, he's always a priest. We talk about laicized priests for those who, for one reason or another, uh, ought no longer to exercise their priesthood. Maybe they, you know, felt they fell in love, or maybe they did something wicked. Um, their soul has not changed. That mark is always there. But we say you can't exercise your role anymore. You're always a priest, just like you're always baptized. Okay, So I think that's just worth uh, noting. Now, the final thing that I'll talk about um, in uh, holy orders, why do we say orders? That's supposed to be an R. Um, we say holy, that looks like an eight. Who cares? <laughs> okay, so uh, holy orders because um, there are different grades or ranks of uh, orders. And so can people help me name them? So what's the, what's the lowest? The lowest rank of? Yeah, deacon. Okay, good. Okay. Deacon. And um, who can be a deacon? A uh, Okay, a man, but there are more qualifications. Yeah. Catholic, yeah, Catholic. yeah, okay, right. You know, we're not gonna have a Hindu deacon. <laughs> true, true. Okay, so uh, he can be married or not, and he has to be over the age of thirty-five, and he has to be qualified for the service, which means he has to live an upright life. His house has to be in order, huh? and um, and the uh, and his wife has to agree to it. Actually, interestingly enough. Now, the thing is, uh, a married deacon is actually a new phenomenon. It's something that came around um, after the 60s, which I don't know if it recommends it or not. But it, um, anyway, but before that, deacons were always celibate. There, there were permanent deacons, um, but they were always celibate. They just had a lower role with respect to liturgy, but they sometimes had more power over temporal goods. Okay. And then, what's, what's the next one? Brothers. Priest. Okay, this is good. This is good. Father. Brother. Okay. Okay, they have nothing to do with each other per se. And we also like put sister over here. Okay, and I'll explain that actually in the question and answer period, because that's 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 a great question. Okay, priest. So um, can a deacon perform any sacraments that a lay person can, cannot perform. In other words, does he, have, does, does he have a sacramental power that lay people do not have? The answer is no. No. A deacon can bless, um, but he can't actually perform. He can't perform the Eucharist. He can't anoint people. He can't hear confessions. But he does have a proper role in the liturgy. So a deacon would read the gospel, and um, then the, the deacon can also, as I said, he can bless when the priest isn't there. Yeah. Um, prior to the 60s, was the deacon like maybe a position for like someone who was studying to become a priest? Mm -hmm. okay. Yep. And actually still now, every priest, uh, before you become a priest, you actually become a deacon first. Okay. And so you just, it's just, you just go through that stage. Even if you're not 35 yet? Yes. Okay. Yep. So a permanent deacon uh -huh. has to be over 35. A, okay. um, a transitional deacon, um, I think the minimum age is 24. Okay. Or max, yeah, minimum, minimum age is 24, yeah. Okay. So I was, I was a deacon once, you know, back in my youth. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and then, and then the top would be? Father is right. Whoa, okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, no, not Pope. Bishop. Bishop, yeah. Why is Pope not at the top of the list of holy orders? Because the Pope is a bishop. Because a Pope is a bishop. That's right. So what we would do is we would say, in the ranks of bishops, we would say the Pope was here, and then we would say others. <laughs> okay? But that's not actually, he's not ordained Pope. 
he's elected pope. People talk about how you know we have you know, a monarchical structure. Well, it's actually partly democratic because he's voted for. Mm -hmm. It's not it's not a special holy order. There's no consecration. There's no laying on of hands. There's no anointing with oil. Is that interesting? We say he's infallible. The infallibility does not come through ordination. It comes through the election. Is that interesting? Wow. Okay. So he's he's a bishop. He's he's the head of the bishops because he's the successor of Peter, the bishop of Rome. And then we have priest. So, so here's kind of something neat, is that the top includes the lower ones. And so if somebody was, um, you know, you, you pull a man out, um, Jason, you're not going to get married, we're going to ordain you a bishop tomorrow. <laughs> you're like, uh, okay. <laughs> Sorry, Maria, you know. Um, so uh, so the, uh, uh, if he was ordained a bishop, he would automatically have the powers of a priest and a deacon. Okay, because they include, the, the higher includes the lower. And generally speaking, um, in order to get to the higher, you go through the lower. So that's just something interesting to think about. Okay. The last thing that I want to insist on before we close here um, is what Pope Benedict XVI said, which I think was very helpful in thinking about holy orders. He says, it's important to realize that Priesthood is not a job. It's not a job. Priesthood is a way of life configured to Christ. A way of life configured to Christ. <coughs> Here's what he says. He says, um, the priest, if, if, being a priest is a job with working hours. Then he's free and he lives only for himself. But the priest, in fact, is a passionate man of Christ who carries in himself the fire of Christ's love. And so you should be full of the joy of the gospel. All right, so, so this helps us then to see uh, why priests are paid so little. <laughs> Actually, um, uh, you know, as a Dominican, because I make a vow of poverty, I, I don't have uh, any money. I don't even have a bank account. And then, you know, the local priests, however, because it's not a job, and you don't want to have anybody come in uh, for any you know, base uh, motives, um, they always have, uh, it's like a very low, low salary cap. I mean, it's, it's almost at poverty level. It's really astonishing. And, and yet people you know, still enter every year. So why? Because you love Christ and you love his people and you want to serve Christ and serve his people. I haven't talked about celibacy and I also haven't talked about um, <coughs> how the holy orders relate to the vows. Um, if anybody has questions about that, I'd be happy to answer those. But otherwise, it's break time. So any questions? Yeah. Can you tell me how the brothers and the sisters kind of fit in with all that? <clears throat> okay. So, um, so basically, we would uh, how would I put it? The um, so so this this is the sacramental system. There we go. Uh, to be to to be a deacon or a priest or a bishop. Those are sacraments that change a person. Um, to be a brother or a sister is to make a vow. And the vow doesn't change your soul, it changes your state of life. So uh, it's, it's similar to, in that way, um, just, it's almost like making a contract. You're saying, I'm going to try to live in this manner of life according to this way of life. Did you know that you know when people? Um, I was just talking with one of our parishioners recently. She's in college, and um, she was. I was. She was describing her summer. You know what's coming up for the summer, and she was saying that she wants to um, go down to Disney World and work for Disney. Now, have you seen a contract that a Disney worker has to sign? Um, it's actually really. It's it's extensive, and um, and you have to act like the Disney worker wherever you go when you're on the Disney grounds. And if you're off campus and you're not acting Disney-like. You might get fired. Okay, so what's the analogy? Um, 
Am I really saying that being a brother is like being a Disney brother? <laughs> <laughs> I guess that's what I was saying. That wasn't great. <laughs> so, <coughs> that's, that's a certain way. Okay. Um, that's basically it, though. <laughs> I mean, I could talk about the Old Testament meaning and, you know, blah, 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 blah. But basically, um, you, are, you are living a certain way of life. Your soul is not changed. And sometimes for brothers, they have temporary vows. So we have our novices here, they're here for one year. We can actually kick them out any time. They can leave at any time. And then they make a vow for three years. And then it's a little more difficult. You have to go through a whole process. So they're brothers. They're brothers. So the they're brothers. They're brothers, yeah. Yeah. Can they stay brothers forever? Um, no. Okay. Because brother has a trajectory. Uh -huh. No, no, actually, no, they could remain a brother forever. I'm sorry. Um, so some brothers are brothers forever, and then some brothers become fathers. <laughs> it's a little confusing. Um, I'm going to draw you a Venn diagram, but if it doesn't make sense, you know, that's just because of my artistic skills. Okay, so here's, here's this might, this might help explain things. Um, we'll see if it works. Okay, so I'm going to say, they, okay. That's this circle here. Wow, that was it. Mm, looks, looks better from close up. Okay, and then we're gonna say ordained. Okay, and uh, that's this circle here. Okay, and notice the circles they don't meet. Okay, and then what we're gonna do? Oh no. Okay, I have to redo this. It needs to touch but not overlap. There we go. Okay, now here, oops, has to be that little part where the, do, do, do you see where I'm, do you know where this is going at? <laughs> You're like, Father Ezra, this is not helpful. Okay, uh, there we go. <laughs> oh my gosh, well, you get the point, you get the point. Okay, okay, all right. Friars, okay? Bro. Brr. Does that make sense? Okay, and then and then we're gonna have uh, like sisters. Okay, does that make sense now? So in other words, some friars are ordained. We call them father. Some friars are not ordained, we call them brother. Brother can go to that side. But generally, when you call someone a friar, they're a brother. No. No? So a friar could go either way? I know, it's confusing, because it comes from the French frère, and frère is brother. <laughs> Let's not get into that. <laughs> a friar means you're a Dominican or you're a Franciscan. Okay. Some Dominicans are father, and some are brother. So that does that help kind of categorize things? Sisters. Not going there. Um, and I guess there's one more question. Yeah. So, um, can fathers, can priests, what happens when they leave the priesthood, or if they leave the priesthood, what are the... Yeah, good question. So then what we would do is we would, we would, um, this would be the... <laughs> <laughs> so, so they're, they're still ordained, and then, and, you know, and but then they, they act... <coughs> And there's like kind of like a little wavy line of communication. Can they still get communion? It doesn't really work, I know. It, it, the Venn diagram it breaks down at that point. <laughs> um, basically, you, 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 uh, if a priest, if a priest, see all these words are c kind of inaccurate. To say he leaves the priesthood isn't, in, isn't accurate because he's still a priest internally. You say he's defrocked, you say, when was he ever frocked? <laughs> <laughs> What's the frock that you're taking off? I don't know. So defrocked doesn't make a lot of sense either. Um, and then some people say laicized. Well, that doesn't make sense either because he doesn't become a layman. You see, he acts like a layman. So, so if, if he goes through the process and you have to, he actually has to go to the Pope and they review your case and everything like that. And then, uh, and then what happens is you can get permission to live as a layman which means after that point, then you can get married and so on. And then you could receive Holy Communion. But you could not celebrate the sacraments. 
Because one of my friends' dads used to be a priest. And I always wondered how. Yeah, yeah. So, so it's kind of funny. Like you would say, technically 